Hello and welcome. Next we continue with chapter 17, Sound Waves. Uh, after this section we should be able to state an expression for the velocity of a sound wave. We should be able to define a number of concepts. These concepts are displacement amplitude, pressure amplitude and the intensity of a sound wave. We need to be able to derive an expression for the amplitude associated with longitudinal waves and derive an expression for the intensity of sound waves. We're also going to look at two very important effects that perhaps you've heard of before. The first is the Doppler effect and the second is the Mach number. And of course we're going to be solving problems on each of these different concepts. There are in fact three different kinds of sound waves. The first kind is audio sound waves and these lie within the sensitivity of our human ear. So this means it's a, 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 sound, a sound that we're able to hear, for example, a musical instrument, human voice or loudspeaker. The second type is infrasonic waves and these have frequencies below the audio range. So we're not able to, to hear them as humans. Examples of these are um, the elephants using infrasonic waves to communicate and they may even do so over many uh, kilometers. So even though the elephants can hear the sound, the humans uh, can't hear the sound. Then we also have ultrasonic or ultrasound waves and these have frequencies above the audio range. Examples are a uh, you know, silent uh, dog whistle. This is sort of a little whistle you can get at the pet store and only your dog can, can hear that or other animals can hear. And uh, the dogs can easily hear the sound or the humans don't detect it. Other examples are ultrasound waves used in medical imaging. And here we have an example of that. This is a baby within a womb. Um, you know, you can go to the doctor and have a scan done and they use um, ultrasound waves to, to, to form this image. Another example, an interesting example is someone invented a, a ringtone and the ringtone is only detectable by teenagers or young people and adults or their parents can't hear uh, when the, you know, the phone's ringing or messages are delivered. And this is because the, the frequency sensitivity of, of your human ear, it changes with time. Uh, you can pause this video and uh, take a read through this article, it's pretty interesting. We start with the definition of bulk modulus and this is something that relates to other regions of uh, physics and engineering you know beyond sound and what it has to do with uh, it has to do with us having a block and you can imagine if initially the block is it has the dimensions as shown by this dashed line and then imagine we apply forces on this block so we apply an equal forces from the front from the bottom from the right from the top from all sides then what happens is this block it will change shape it will become co compressed and we'll end up with this uh, brown block. And then we define the, the bulk modulus as the volume stress divided by the volume strain. And it relates to the amount of force that, that we apply in relative to the change in volume. So in this expression, uh, delta F will be the, the force that's been applied. A will be the area of each of, of these uh, sides of the, the block. Uh, delta V will be the change in volume and VI will be the initial volume and it can be rewritten as uh, minus the change in pressure uh, over the ratio of, of the volumes. Remember the change in force over change in area will be change in pressure. And we can go look at uh, tables and look up different uh, bulk modulus values for different materials. It's a constant, it's a function of the material. The reciprocal of uh, bulk modulus is called the compress compressibility of a material. So remember when we use the word reciprocal, we're speaking about one over that quantity um, and compressibility will tell us how easily is the material uh, compressed. Here we have two equations which we're not going to derive but we're just going to be using. The first is that we are referring to the speed of sound in a gas. 
then that can be given by the square root of the bulk modulus divided by the density of the, of the gas. The second uh, equation we have relates the speed of sound in air to the temperature of that air. So as stated here, the speed of sound depends on the temperature of the medium. And for, for sound traveling through air, we have this expression where the speed is equal to 333 meters per second times the square root of 1 plus Tc over 273. Note this Tc is the temperature in degrees uh, Celsius. And using this expression, we find that the, the speed of sound in air at 20 degrees Celsius is approximately 343 meters per second. If the temperature goes up, then um, Tc will have a, you know, a bigger value and this will cause the speed of sound to increase with an increase of temperature. An explanation for that is that as the temperature increases, the little air molecules have more energy, so they are more easily able to move and, and transmit and the sound. Um, we should also be aware that for different uh, materials, uh, we'll have different uh, speeds of sound, be it in, in water, in um, the speed of sound is 1,493 1, meters per second. In seawater, it might be slightly different. In mercury, it would have a different value. Here are the values we were talking about uh, with respect to air. So be aware that there are these lookup tables where you can look up the speed of sound in, in different materials. Here what we have is uh, a look at the pressure variation in sound waves. So continuing consider an example where we have a piston which is moving backwards and forwards. So before the piston starts moving, we have undisturbed gas in this chamber. Then as the piston moves uh, forward, it causes compression of the gas in the region directly after, um, you know, directly in front of the piston. You can see this darker region shows that the gas has been compressed there. When the piston stops, uh, the compression pulse continues through the through the gas. So you can see now the pulse is is moving along along the length of, of the piston. And by so doing what we've set up is a longitudinal pulse um, of compress compressible in, in the compressible gas. So this region is called a compression and it moves through the tube continuously uh, compressing the region just in front of itself. You can see that motion here. Um, apart from the high pressure areas, we also have low pressure regions shown by the lighter area. And the low pressure, re low pressure regions are called refractions. And they also propagate along the tube. Uh, and both regions, the high pressure uh, and the low pressure refractions, they move at the speed of sound uh, through the, the air. The distance between uh, two consecutive um, refractions or two consecutive compressions, this is uh, equal to the wavelength of the sound wave. Uh, that's shown here. You can see we have one compression over here with one dark region, another compression over here, and the region between these two um, gives us the wavelength. Similarly, we could have measured the wavelength between two refractions or two low pressure areas that would have been between this between this point here and and this point here which gives us the same uh, wavelength we're going to be looking at the mathematics behind this now so what we're interested in is looking at um, gas in some cylinder and uh, we initially have an uncompressed uh, situation and then we also have a compressed situation so an undisturbed element of gas of length delta x, that's this, this length here, is in a tube of cross-sectional area A. So if you look from the side, you'll see that the area of the side is A. Um, when a sound wave propagates through the gas, the element is moved to a new position and has a different length. So what's going to happen is this, this little block of gas um, it's going to be compressed and it's going to 
move to a new position as, as shown here. The parameters S1 and S2 describe the displacement of the ends of the element relative to their equilibrium positions. You can see that uh, from this figure. So if we, if we look at a small little element then, we refer to um, the, the, the amplitude of this, this element. Uh, it's a function of x and a function of t. So it's a function of position and of time. And it's given by this harmonic function, um, s max cos of kx minus omega t. And the reason for that is, you know, that this little, um, little packet of air, it's going to be oscillating, it's going to be moving backwards and forwards. And for that reason, we're using an expression relating to simple harmonic motion, which we saw before. And in this expression, we refer to s max, this term here, as the displacement amplitude. And it is the maximum position of the element relative to equilibrium position. So this is the, the, the maximum position. We refer to, to K, once again, as the wave number. And omega is the angular frequency of the wave. That's something we, we saw before. Um, as this, this little packet is moving uh, to and fro, uh, we're also going to have variations in pressure because remember it's been being compressed. We have re regions of of compression and regions of low pressure refraction, and the pressure, or the variation in pressure, will vary according to this uh, expression. And this is something that, that 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 we will derive. Note that this expression it follows cos. This expression follows sin. In this expression, the pressure amplitude, delta P max, is the maximum change in pressure from, from the equilibrium uh, value. Remember, uh, this is uh, the maximum um, change in pressure, and it will occur under circumstances where sine of kx minus omega t is equal to 1. 1 is the maximum number that sine of kx minus omega 2 can take on, and for that reason, this uh, pressure amplitude delta p max is the maximum change in pressure from equilibrium position. We will now prove the result that we had on the previous slide for the pressure amplitude of a longitudinal wave. So the the situation that we have is exactly the same as as discussed before. We consider a small cylindrical element of undisturbed gas of length delta x and area A. So note that the volume of gas that we have is going to be this area multiplied by delta x. Um, the, the cylinders, two faces move through different distances, S1 and S2. If you look here, you can see this is the one face of the little cylinder and it's moved to this position here. So it's moved through a distance S1. This um, end over here, it's moved to a position shown here. So it's moved through a distance S2. We have a case where the gas has been compressed as we go from this diagram to this diagram. So it means the distances will be difference. For example, for it to be compressed, uh, S1 might be a big distance and S2 might be a much smaller distance causing the compression. The change in volume, delta V, of the elements in the new position is equal to, once again, the area times delta S, where S is the difference in in, in this um, displacement of the two face, uh, faces. So this is the change in volume of the new element. This little element's gonna have a smaller volume than this volume over here, right? Starting with the definition of uh, bulk modulus, um, you know, this would be the, just the definition. Now, 
um, volume is equal to area times delta s. So what we do is we 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 replace this delta volume term as well as the initial vo volume term. The the delta volume term we um, change that by the appropriate um, del uh, area times delta s is described here. And the initial situation, the initial volume is going to be A times delta X, which is where, where this comes from. Now, what we see is we have delta S divided by delta X. And here we have um, something that reminds us of a derivative. If you have a change in something um, divided by change in something else, that can be expressed as a derivative, right? So we have this, this expression shown here. We're simply replacing the, uh, the delta signs by, by, by derivative. But we said previously that um, our, the position of our little um, block of air is going to be given by um, uh, this expression here for following simple harmonic uh, motion. So what we do next is we see that Oh, up here there's the s term and here we have an expression for for the s term so we can substitute this this expression in here and then this gives us the the change in pressure is minus the bolt modulus times the derivative of this um, term which we've just substituted in well we know how to take derivatives of uh, trig, trig functions if you take the derivative of cos, it becomes sine. And then remember, you also need to apply the chain rule where you need to, to take the derivative inside as well. We take in the derivative with respect to x. So if we differentiate whatever's in here, then um, you know this will give us k. Of course, there are no x's here, so this won't contribute to to the to the derivative so when we apply the chain rule to inside this bracket we end up with this k uh, in front and if we're interested in the maximum change in pressure that can occur delta p max remember this will happen when um, this sine term is one the maximum value that the sine a sine term can take on is one so the maximum value that we will be able to get is everything in front of of the sine term which is b s max k but we also know uh, from the previous chapter that the wave number can be expressed as this and uh, one of the first um, equations we, we we saw in this chapter was that the velocity of the sound wave or the speed can be written as the bulk modulus divided by density. So what we do now is we uh, rearrange this expression here for bulk modulus, substitute that in, in for bulk modulus, and we substitute in this equation uh, for k we substitute uh, omega over v. And this leaves us with our final expressions um, that we have. The delta P max is given by this expression here and um, can be simplified to, to the density times the vel uh, velocity times the angular velocity omega times S max. And similarly, the, the, the change in pressure is given by this exact uh, term but of course we need to have the sine um, function instead. Note that for the position of our little element as a function of time, the position is given by a cos function, whereas we see um, delta P max follows or delta P follows a sine function. And for this, uh, we note that, well, because of this, the pressure wave is 90 degrees out of phase with the displacement wave. This one is the is the pressure wave. The this one here represents the 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 displacement wave. So here you can see um, the position wave. It follows a cos function, and we've now derived that the 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 pressure wave it follows a sine function 
these two functions are 90 degrees out of phase because if you shift the the cos wave by 90 degrees it's possible to get a sine wave the pressure variation is a maximum when the displacement from equilibrium is zero so the displacement from equilibrium is zero that's at this point over here uh, we can see that the pressure variation is a maximum so whenever this curve has a maximum value this one will have a minimum value here we have a question which tests our understanding on the relationship between the displacements and the pressures so the question says if you blow across the top of an empty soft drink bottle a pulse of sound travels through the air in the bottle uh, at the moment the pulse reaches the bottom of the bottle what is the correct description of the displacement uh, elements of air from the equilibrium position and the pressure of the air at this point so one way to visualize this might be I uh, think you, you, you blow in at the entrance and you have having uh, a pulse that's propagating through and the pulse is now going to be at the end of the, of the um, bottle, right? And we found that when it reaches the end of the bottle, the displacement is obviously going to be zero. This pulse is, is situated at the zero point. And the pressure is 90 degrees out of phase with the the um, displacement so that means that the the pressure is going to be at a maximum so the answer to this question is c the displacement is zero and the pressure is a maximum so next we're going to derive an expression for the intensity of sound waves the derivation itself is a little bit uh, tricky but we can look through the steps and we certainly need to be able to apply the results so um, the setup that we have is the same as before with the piston and when we refer to an intensity an intensity is power per unit area so we start then with the definition of power which we've already seen in the course can be formulated as the dot product between a force and a velocity um, force can be written as pressure times area and velocity is the time derivative of position so it's the time derivative of position we've already seen that delta p can be replaced by this expression here and the position we said is given by this simple harmonic motion uh, term so substituting these two values in this equation gives us then this expression uh, for the power next we turn our attention to uh, evaluating this derivative when we differentiate cos it becomes minus sine and remember now we differentiating with respect to t so we need to apply the chain rule and when we apply the chain rule we see there's an extra minus omega t that we need to differentiate which gives the derivative as an extra minus omega term introduced so here we have the extra extra omega term appearing and the the minus sign from the cost derivative cancels out with the minus sign from the chain rule um, then we can simplify this you can see we have two sine terms that so become sine squared and uh, multiplying everything out uh, as shown now we're interested to know the 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 power um, we're interested to to know the power or the energy uh, contained in or the average power over one period of oscillation so what we do is we choose to integrate between zero and uh, t so this is for one complete cycle and this gives us the average power over over that period this integral is a little uh, tricky to perform you, you um, won't be able to do this without consulting a table um, but this this whole integral turns out to be a half so if we use this result in our previous expression then we integrate uh, evaluate this integral to be a half and then the expression that we have is that the power is is given by this as i said we we define intensity of a wave as the power per unit area or the rates at which energy 
transported by a wave is transferred through a unit area perpendicular to the direction of travel of the wave. So the intensity is going to be given by the average power divided by the area. And uh, if we take this A to this side, then we'll have um, power over area, which is intensity. And this will give us this uh, expression shown here. We've already also seen that uh, P max, or the, the, the maximum change in pressure, can be given by this expression. So this allows us to rewrite this allows us to rewrite this term as this term and this then is the the final result for the intensity of the wave we take a look now at the intensity of sound waves and specifically spherical sound waves so consider the case where we have um a person or a siren at some central point and perhaps the siren is going off creating a noise and the the sound waves are are moving in in all directions so what we're going to have is the sound waves propagating out in the sphere and um, as you can read here it says we should should uh, consider that the source is perfectly uniform and the power is radiated equally in all directions and then this gives rise to spherical waves each arc represents a surface over which the phase of the wave is constant uh, we call such a surface um, of constant phase a wave front so that's to say that we have these little circles that we draw these are the wave fronts connecting um, areas of either high compression or low pressure refraction. These are wave fronts. The sound is moving out as wave fronts. And what we would like to do is, as, as we said before, we would like to define uh, intensity as the average power divided by area. If you look at the, at the shape we're dealing with, we're dealing with the sound uh, moving out in the direction of a sphere. Only half the sphere has been drawn here, but it's moving out in the full direction of a sphere. And the surface area of a sphere is given by 4 pi radius squared, which is where this factor comes from. Next, we will turn our attention to an example relating to the ear. And the ear is able to detect sounds and it has two thresholds. The first threshold is the threshold of hearing. So this would be the smallest uh, sound or the, the softest sound that it's able to detect. The second threshold would be the threshold of pain. And this would be where the ear is uh, exerted to a very loud sound and experiences pain. And both of these two thresholds will be a function of frequency. So this question asks the faintest sounds the human ear can detect at a frequency of uh, 1000 Hertz corresponds to an intensity of 1 times 10 to the minus 12 watts per meter, what, uh, which is called the threshold of hearing. Uh, the loudest sound the ear can to tolerate at this frequency corresponds to an intensity of 1 watt per meter squared, um, the threshold of pain. Determine the pressure amplitude and the displacement amplitude associated with these two limits. So I'm going to do the calculation for the threshold of hearing and you can for yourself do the similar calculation for the threshold of pain. The information that we're given at the threshold of hearing is that the intensity is uh, 1 times 10 to the minus 12 watts per meter and the frequency that we're working at is uh, 1 kilohertz. And we asked to, to calculate firstly the, the pressure amplitude and secondly the um, displacement amplitude. So from uh, slide 16, one of the equations we saw is that the intensity is related to the pressure amplitude according to this expression. And we given the intensity at the threshold of hearing, we can look up on a table and see what the, the density of, of air is. And we know that the speed of um, sound in air is 343 meters per second. So we can rearrange this expression to find out an expression for the, the pressure amplitude. It comes out to this. 
then substituting the different values we given we uh, the solution comes out to 2.87 times 10 to the minus 5 uh, newtons per meter squared remember it's a pressure so it's a force per area second thing we asked to calculate is the displacement amplitude so this relates to by by how much will those little particles of air in your ear or little packets of air in your air in your ear be moving from left to right as they vibrate and um, the expression that we can use is the the expression that we saw from slide at 12 uh, we can now know what the the pressure amplitude is we found that right so we can rearrange this expression to make the displacement amplitude the subject of the equation and then uh, another thing we should just be careful to note is that we given the frequency f but in this equation it calls for the angular frequency omega and the relationship between angular frequency and frequency is angular frequency is 2 pi f omega is 2 pi f so we make that substitution in then we're able to substitute all the values in and we found out that the answer is 1.1 uh, times 10 to the minus 11 meters so this is very very small it's around um, 10 it's around 11 picometers it's a very small distance um, that the, the the air is moving in your ear to detect those very faint uh, sounds so it shows what a wonderful and sensitive instrument our ears actually are so i leave as example for you to do the problem um, relating to the threshold of pain and you'll do it in exactly the same way but in this case you'll use um, the intensity of one watt per meter squared sorry this is a, a mistake you should you should redo the the problem but of course you should use the intensity equal to one watt per meter squared take a look now at an example of spherical waves in the example a point source emits sound waves with an average power of 80 watts and we asked to a find the intensity uh, three meters from the source and find the distance at which the intensity of the sound is uh, one times 10 to the minus eight watts per meter squared so the example of a point source we said might be a siren so i've drawn a, a picture of a siren and it will be um, emitting sound in all directions so the the sound will be passing through the surface area of the sphere and that from the definition the intensity is going to be the average power divided by the area of the sphere the area of the sphere is four pi radius squared and uh, remember the area of a sphere is the same as uh, four circles so it's four pi radius squared and uh, using the information that we given for the first problem we can use the power as 80 watts and we can use the radius as three meters and then the intensity calculates out to be 0 0.0 so 0 0.707 watts per meter squared in the second uh, question we asked to find a distance and we given an intensity so we use exactly the same uh, formula but we just rearrange it and make the distance r the subject of the the formula then using the average power that we given and using the intensity that we given um, we come out to a distance of uh, 2.52 times 10 to the 4 uh, meters apart from the linear scale engineers are often interested in using or they're fond of using decibel scales and when we use a db scale or decibel scale we make use of a, a log relation so the sound level in decibels is defined as 10 log r over r naught where r naught is the threshold of hearing this constant given by 1 times 10 to the minus 12 watts per meter squared 
So given any intensity, you can then convert it to dB or vice versa. And this gives you some indication of uh, different uh, sounds. Uh, there's a whisper is 30 dB all the way up to a jackhammer being 150 dB. The next thing we're going to be looking at is something very interesting. It's called uh, the Doppler effect. And perhaps you would have noticed when there's a vehicle coming towards you, it's siren or hooter. It changes as the vehicle moves past you. The frequency of the sound that you hear as the vehicle approaches you is higher than the frequency that you hear as it moves away from you. And this effect is called uh, the Doppler effect. Uh, just as a note, when, when describing sound, when we refer to frequency, if we speak of high frequency, then we're speaking about something that sounds like you know, like a mosquito, whereas low frequency would be a noise like it's a lot, lot, lot lower frequency. So those are the two sounds. Uh, what we're going to have a look at now is an example of uh, a fire engine approaching a person and the siren is on and um, the the siren isn't changing but the sound that the that we hear changes as the fire engine approaches us and passes us i want you to to listen if you can hear the change That change in frequency was quite noticeable for the fire engine and now we're going to explain it in terms of, of the Doppler effect. So the explanation relies on a setup like this. We have, have a, a police car and it's got a siren and initially we're looking at um, the case where the p police car is standing still. We have two observers. There's one observer behind the police car and one observer in front. And if the siren is going off, you can see we'll have these spherical wave fronts uh, moving out. And notice that the, the wave fronts are evenly spaced. The distance between each yellow and black line is the same. It's evenly spaced behind the car and it's also evenly spaced in front of the car. Next, what we're going to look at is the case where the car is moving. So when the car is moving, then what's happened is it's, you know, moving at some speed towards this uh, person on the right. What's happening is as it's moving, the wave fronts are piling up in front of the car. Because remember, the wave fronts are also moving forward, but now the source is also moving and the ambulance is moving. And this is causing these wave fronts to, to pile up in front, whereas as the ambulance move forward, the wave fronts uh, behind the, the vehicle, they get left behind and they're kind of more spaced out. So because of this effect, we find that, you know, this is going to have a small uh, wavelength or a higher frequency. The waves are, uh, are repeating very often. So they're repeating at a high frequency, whereas the observer behind the car behind the ambulance will experience or hear a lower frequency and this is then what we call uh, the Doppler effect and this also explains what we heard in the video that we watched when the ambulance was approaching us we heard a high frequency sound whereas when it was moving away from us we heard that a lower frequency sound when it comes to doing calculations and actually calculating the changes in frequency, then we have some nomenclature that we use. So now we're going to derive uh, the equations for the Doppler effect. The nomenclature that we use is the first one is the source. We represent that by S. So if the ambulance is moving, it has some veloci velocity Vs. Then we also have observers. Remember that the observers may also be moving. Um, this person might be on a skateboard. He might be moving towards the ambulance or he might be moving away. 
So we represent the, the, the speed of the um, observer as VO and the speed of the ambulance as VS. Here we have another observer, this would be VO. Uh, the other symbols that we use is we use lambda, that's the wavelength of um, sound in air, which we know at room temperature is 343 3 meters per second. This lambda prime is the relative wavelength of the sound. So this is the, the wavelength that, that, you know, that's drawn here, the wavelength that, that will result um, as a consequence of the Doppler effect. And then we also have um, V being the, the sound, the speed of sound in air. Sorry, the speed of sound in air is 343 3 meters per second. Of course, the wavelength isn't 343 3 meters per second, as I just said, that was the error. So let's take a look at the derivation of the Doppler effect. The first um, case we're going to derive is for a source moving away from the observer. So here we have the observer standing still and we have the source, the ambulance with its siren moving away. So what we see is that the relative wavelength of, of the sound, this lambda prime, it's become bigger, right? It's become bigger. It's more spaced out. So this is going to be the wavelength of sound in air plus some additional increments which caused it to increase. This uh, increment is going to relate to the speed of the source. We know that um, velocity is uh, lambda times frequency so you can rearrange that and you can rewrite a wavelength, a lambda is velocity over frequency. So in this case for this guy observer here we have a bigger wavelength, so it's expressed as shown, and we can, can write this as, as such. Uh, but if we're interested in, in the frequency, the observed frequency, or the relative frequency of the, of the sound, frequency is velocity over wavelength. So now what we need to do is use our new wavelength in this expression. So we substitute um, lambda plus Vs over F in, in the bottom. And uh, next what we do is we, you know, replace this lambda term by Vf, by, by V over F, the velocity of uh, sound, the speed of sound in air, divided by the source's frequency. And we come out to, for this expression with, the, uh, for a source moving away from the observer, we find that the observed frequency, so that's the frequency that you hear, it differs from the frequency of the siren by this factor here. We can do a similar derivation for the second case. And the second case is where we have the observer standing still. And the ambulance is now moving towards the observer. In this case, the wave fronts are piling up. So the wave fronts will be smaller than normal. So for this case, um, case, you know, the perceived, the relative wa wave fronts, they will be the original ones minus uh, some in increment so that they can be smaller. This increment is rewritten as the velocity of the source over the frequency. And then once again, we're interested in the relative frequency. So we use the definition that frequency is velocity over wavelength. And we can uh, substitute this equation in as before for lambda prime and this time we come out to have an expression of the uh, observed frequency is differs from the original frequency by this factor again it depends on on the velocity of speed in a and the velocity of um, the 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 source but now we have a minus um, factor so when it comes to the Doppler effect, we know that the observed frequency or the frequency that the observer hears is different to the frequency of, of the source. And this expression summarizes the relationship uh, between those two frequencies. F prime is the observed frequency and F is the frequency of the source. 
Of course, there can be a number of different cases in that the both the observer and the source can be moving. And they can either be moving towards each other or they can be moving away from each other. And the text in this uh, block, it, it tells you that according to the direction of the movement, you need to choose the sign in these equations appropriately. And I really want to stress how important this choice of sign is in creating, in, in getting the correct answer. And the way to choose the sign is uh, written in the second part of this block. In this expression, the signs for the values of V0 and Vs depend on the direction of velocity. A positive value for the speed of the observer or source is substituted if the velocity of one is towards the other. Whereas a negative ve value represents a velocity of one away from the other. So that's telling us that if the observer and the source are moving towards one another, we're going to use a positive value for Vs and Vo. Whereas if the observer and the source are moving away from one another, we're going to use a negative sign for Vs and Vo. Perhaps you would already have watched this episode of um, Big Bang Theory where Sheldon says he's not going to the Halloween party or the dress up party as a zebra, he's going as the Doppler effect. And now you're finally able to understand his outfits uh, where he has a source shown by the dots and the wave fronts moving out uh, outwards. And also note how the wave fronts aren't equally spaced, so it is, we can confirm it is the, is the Doppler effect. The next example we look at relates to a train approaching us as we're standing on a platform. So the question says, uh, you're standing on a platform at a train station and you listen to a train approaching the station at a constant velocity. While the train approaches, but before it arrives, what do you hear? And then we're given various options relating to the intensity increasing or decreasing and the frequency increasing or decreasing. If we draw a picture relating to this uh, question, here we are waiting at the train station, here comes the train. Um, obviously, as the train is approaching us, the intensity of the sound is going to be increasing. So, you know, as something gets closer to you, the sound gets louder. So the intensity R must be increasing as the train gets closer. If we draw what's happening to the wave fronts, we can see according to the Doppler effect, the wave fronts, they're going to be piling up on the front end of the train because the train is moving towards the right. And because of this, you can see that their frequency is going to be increasing. So frequency F must be increasing due to the Doppler effects. And if we look at a look at the different uh, options, then option A relates to the in intensity and the frequency of the sound both increasing. So next we look at a problem on the Doppler effect, and this is a problem we can all all relate to. In the problem, your clock radio wakes you up with a steady and irritating sound at a frequency of 600 hertz. One morning, your clock radio malfunctions and it cannot be turned off. In frustration, you drop your clock radio out the fourth story building window, which is 15 meters from the ground. Assume that the frequency of that, assume that the speed of sound is 343 three meters per second. As you listen to the fall, falling clock radio, what frequency do you hear just before it strikes the ground? Right, so I've made a little, a little picture of what's happening. We on the fourth uh, floor of our building and our alarm clock's gone off and we've thrown it out the window. It's landed on the ground and as it falls to the ground, uh, we'll be hearing some frequency. Remember the frequency that we hear in, it isn't the same as the frequency that we it's emitting. This is because it's moving away from us and because it's moving away from us, 
and the frequency is actually expected to be lower. The formula that we want to be using is this formula here. If you look at the quantities we uh, in, in this formula, F prime relates to the frequency that we would be hearing. F relates to the original frequency of the clock and that's given to us as 600 Hertz. The other quantities that we need to know is V. Well, V is the speed of sound in air and that's given as 343 3 meters per second. We need to know V subscript O, which is the, the speed of the observer. Of course, you, you're just lying in bed, so you're not moving, so that's going to be zero. The other quantity we need to know is Vs, the speed of the source. And in this problem, the source is the alarm clock. That's the object emitting the sound. And we asked to calculate the frequency just before the alarm clock hits the ground. Um, so for this reason, the, the, we need to know Vs, the speed of the alarm clock, the speed of the source, just before it hits the ground. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the equations of motion to calculate what that Vs needs to be. Um, we given that the initial speed of the alarm clock is zero. Uh, the distance is minus 15 meters. Remember, it's 15 meters downwards from where the, the um, motion begins. The acceleration is also minus 9.8 meters per second. And then we can use the, uh, this equation of motion to calculate the speed of the alarm clock, the Vs, the speed of the source, is 17.15 um, meters per second. Now we can uh, make use of, of, um, of the Doppler effect equation to calculate the, the frequency, F prime. Uh, we have all the values, but remember this is the crucial part. The one thing we need to take care of is what sign do we need to use for for each of the the values for for of a vs and a vvo and the the rule the convention or the rule is that if the observer and the source are moving together then we need to use a plus sign if they're moving apart then we need to use a minus sign if we have a look what's uh, happening, that we have the observer, it's you in your bed and the alarm clock moving downwards. Of course, the, 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 two, uh, the two are moving apart, the alarm clock's moving away. So the sign that we want to be using for VO and VS is a minus sign. So that's why here I've made this minus zero. And for this, um, Vs at the bottom, I've made this minus uh, seventeen point one five, and calculating what the answer is, it comes out to be five hundred and seventy one point four two hertz. So we conclude this um, chapter by looking at a definition and uh, looking at shock waves and the Mach number. So when we're speaking about this, we're speaking about uh, a source that is moving faster than the speed of sound. For example, perhaps it's a, a jet that's uh, moving very fast. So Vs, the speed of the, the source, it exceeds that of the speed of the wave V, which in this case would be the speed of sound uh, in air. So we might have a jet uh, moving to, towards the right, and as it moves, the sound uh, moves out in these uh, circles as shown. And the way that the that the Mach uh, number is defined, it's uh, defined in terms of the half angle or the Mach angle. So what you can see is we have a little right angle triangle uh, shown here. And this triangle, it has an angle theta. This distance is going to be the speed of sound V times T. And this distance here is going to be the speed of the aircraft, Vs times T. Um, and then by looking at the geometry, we can take a sine of theta, that will be Vt over Vst. 
where it's subscript s remember it's just the the speed of the source of course the the time cancels out and we left with this ratio the half angle theta is called the mach angle and the ratio vs over v refers to the mach number Right, so this concludes the, the chapter on sound waves.